Good morning, everybody, or good whatever time of day it is where you are in the world. I expect we've got some people representing time zones galore. Um, and I am, uh, I'm going to use this live stream to answer some of your questions. We have some pre-submitted questions uh, from my show Savage Builds on the Discovery Channel. Um, you know, I probably should have checked in before this broadcast to make sure that Savage Builds was potentially viewable on Discovery's over-the-top streaming service. Is it? Do we know that? I probably should have checked. I don't know. Um, at any rate, <laughs> uh, in the uh, uh, in the beginning of 2000, and it is great. In the beginning of 2019, uh, I was that when I did it. Was that when we did it? Yeah, I think it was. Time compression is really weird these days, but I think we went into production on Savage Builds in the spring of 2019, right? Because the book tour was early 2019. Yeah. Uh, Savage Builds started airing already uh, in, the, in the, I think, the second quarter of 2019. We made uh, 10 episodes for Discovery. I am really, I couldn't be more proud of them, uh, of those episodes. And I had an amazing crew. Um, uh, before I get started with today, uh, I just want to tell you somebody who's going to be on my mind today as we're talking about Savage Builds, uh, because everyone is painfully aware that we lost Grant Imahara this, this last year. Um, but what you, uh, likely don't know is that, uh, less than a month before Grant died, um, my partner in making Savage Builds, the showrunner and lead producer, John Tesse, also passed away. Um, and so uh, it is very bittersweet for me to think about the production of Savage Builds. I have uh, I have been blessed in my professional life with some amazing executive producers, Dan Tapster uh, from Mythbusters, a key one. Uh, and John Tesse was another uh, producing. Uh, he, I, I produced both Mythbusters Jr. and Savage Builds with John. Um, he was an incredible showrunner, a wonderful producer, a wonderful manager of people. Uh, he made both of those shows way better than I could have made them by myself. Uh, and the, the unit cohesion we enjoyed on both of those shoots was stunning. So just letting you know. Um, but before I get started with the Q&As on Savage Builds, I have a little bit of a build. I recently obtained a bit of shop kit. Uh, that I'm right after this broadcast, I'm going to shoot a tool tip about it. So I'm not going to talk too much about this tool. In fact, I'm not going to talk about it nearly at all, except to name it. It is called a Hamer gauge, H-A-I-M-E-R. Um, this Hamer gauge has changed my life and, uh, I'll be shooting a tool tip about just how and why it has changed my life. But for today, what you need to know is that it arrived, well, it arrived like this. Um, normally when you buy tools for your machine tools, like a mill or a lathe, they come in, they come in boxes like this. So this is this German boring head. Yeah, I know it's boring. Uh, this is a German boring head that I purchased, uh, on eBay, uh, in the fall. Oh my God, it's such a pretty, pretty unit. Um, and this old kind of semi crappy finger jointed box. This is exactly what all machine tools arrive in. And it's great. You end up with a shelf full of all these boxes. But my hammer gauge, my hammer gauge arrived boxless. So we're going to remedy that today. Now, uh, this gauge is in imperial measurements. However, it's almost always a metric gauge because almost the whole world is in metric, except for us here in the US and I think Myanmar. Uh, so it's got a 10 millimeter shaft, which doesn't quite fit any of the uh, five, uh, R8 collets I use for my mill. So I had to purchase a custom, uh, not a custom, but I purchased a 10 millimeter uh, R8 collet to live with this so that when I need to use it, I can chuck it into my mill. That's the longest way of explaining that I'm going to build a box that fits both my Hamer gauge here. Oh, right, you can see the close up on that camera. Um, I'm going to build a box that fits both this Hamer gauge here and its collet because that's how I'm going to be using it almost all the time. Now, I did a little bit of a cooking show advance work. I did some cooking show advance work on this box build. 
Uh, and so I'm going to lay it out for you how this is going to go. I made some cradles out of plywood here. Uh, and these are simply three pieces of plywood I drilled some different size holes in. And then I cut them in half. So um, if I put them like this, that's the top part and this is the bottom part. And I think maybe you can see how this is going to go. Yeah, see that? So this one gets tossed. I don't need that one. Oh, actually, I might even be able to use that. Oh, that was pretty close. Yeah, I could do it like this. Um, and that doesn't matter. So uh, then these two would be here in the lid and my box would surround this shape like this, hinge here at this point and allow me access to my hammer gauge. Yeah, that's the goal. I've got some quarter inch, uh, uh, some quarter inch plywood here. So I'm gonna start to mark out these pieces. I'm gonna make some cuts on my table saw my table saw right there behind me. Uh, and uh, we're gonna just knock out a little box. I've got a, a 23 gauge pin nailer and some uh, some PVA wood glue and I'm not afraid to use them. Okay, here we go. Uh, break out a square. So uh, I think it's a parts list that I wanna make here. So just a sec. Don't need any of that stuff. So the bottom and the top of this box are both going to be 2.25 inches. So 2.25 by, by how long? 2.25 by that. All right, here, let's get out. Gonna get out the bigger calipers. What is that? Eight and a half? Eight and a half. That's a, cutting it a little close. 8.75. Ah, oh, this is an issue I always have when I'm making boxes for things. I tend to make them too tight because I think, oh, I need to maximize my shelf space. So I think 8.75 makes sense. So 2.25 by 8.75 times two. Right, that's the bottom and top. Bottom and top. 2.25, just double checking that. 2.25, yeah, by 8.75, okay. Place this here, like that. I want to make those two cuts and come on back. Uh, uh, right, right, right. I got to make my mark. 2.25. Right, and 8.75. If I do that, I'm going to need to cut two of those. And then the 8.75. Trying to figure out where the marks are going to end up. Yeah. And then that one's going to end up like about. Yeah, I can be a little sloppy with that. All right. Uh, 8.75 is first cut. Uh, and then we're going to cut That's the length, and that will be all four. That will be all four sides. So now it's two at two point two five. Right. Two point two So now we need to figure out the top. So let's see, this is the top. 
top, bottom, and we have this and that. Yep. And so, right, that's that. So if I do this, I allow it to be just a little bit bigger. Yep, I'll get two out of there. Okay, great. So these are the sides. And that's three point, let's make that 3.25. It's just a nice round number. 3.25 times two. Yep. Will you hand me one of the fresh sanding sticks there? To the right, there you go, perfect. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> okay, now we have the bottom and the top and the two sides. <clears throat> and now I need the ends. And the ends are, right, the end are the sides missing two widths. So. that right yes oh did i screw this up i think i screwed this up um hang on hang on okay let's see if i gave myself enough room here i did i did i think i did i think i did i think i did <laughs> Okay, uh, cool. I'll explain why I'm confused in just a second, but this is end, and this is end, and this measurement is uh, 2 point, it is almost 2.75, but it's 2.7, it's 2.725, okay, there we go. Uh, I'm going to use this one. So we have six sides now, and did I mess that up? I don't think I messed it up. Okay, let's see how we did here. Uh, that's the bottom, that's the bottom, that's the bottom, that's the side, that's the side, that's the top, and then the end fits there. Hey, look at that, that actually all fits together, terrific. Um, I think we can assemble that after after we sand some things. Yeah. Normally I do this on one of my belt sanders, but they're all behind the camera, so you're going to get to see me do it in real time with that sanding stick. I used to make these out of out of tongue depressants. Sorry, that was my meteorite sword. Uh, I used to make sanding sticks like this out of tongue depressors. Once a year at ILM, I would um, I would take a bunch of different sheets of 80, 100, 120, 150, 180, et cetera, and I would glue a bunch of popsicle sticks to each sheet and cut them out, and that would be my sanding sticks for the next, you know, seven or eight months. And then I discovered while perusing the aisles of Sally's Beauty Supply, that somebody already does that. <laughs> and I don't need to spend all that time and energy making sanding sticks. I still have some of the old ones up in the rack even from way back in the late 90s. 
You can never have too many sanding sticks. You really, you really just can't. Grab a couple every time you're heading to the beauty store. Seriously. It's also where I got my fake hair for my chewy costume. The beauty supply. I love going to, I love looking at the tools used in industries that I have no idea about and seeing what kind of specialized equipment they have. Okay. Do I seem a little manic? I feel like I'm being a little manic, manic here. Okay. What's that? All right. Uh, top and bottom. Let's get this going. Whether I'm cooking or working in the shop, I like a I like a rag on my shoulder. Uh, right. Get some glue along the side here. Yeah, I know. I know the old box was all finger jointed, but I'm not going to do that. There we go. Oh, this 23 gauge nailer, dude. Tom Sachs changed my life by telling me about this. I don't know why it had escaped my attention up until then, but it had. Great. Okay, that's the bottom, that's the top. Come on, really? Don't blow it through. Thank you. Oh, let's get those out of there. <clears throat> As always. Let's do both of those. Ah, uh, no, we'll do these right now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, shit. We have some giant things arriving in the shop right now. Uh, big machines. Big machines. It's all giant machines this week. Exciting. I like receiving giant machines. Okay. Um... If you haven't watched a lot of tested videos, and this is the first time you're seeing me, here's where I'm going to tell you that using a, uh, a nailer, keep your fingers so far away from the potential path of that nail. These things will go right through you. And once they've tasted blood, well, you know, it's like a Stephen King novel. Uh, all right, here we go. That is that is most of our box right there. I'm gonna put in the ends. I'm a little bit short. I like hair. I, I, I hear you having a question, and I'm going to answer it very shortly. You're wondering how perhaps I'm making a box that I'm going to put something in when I'm not making an entrance or exit for this box, and I will explain in very short order. Just a little bit. Awesome. 
Oh, I love press fits. Oh, that's great. Fabulous. Just a few more staples. Okay, now, I have a box. How do I get my thing into this box is the question. And the answer is I'm gonna use my table saw. I'm actually gonna slice this box right through its midsection. And then I'm going to attach some little hinges that I've got. And I'm gonna attach some little closures that I've got. And we'll put our hammer gauge in there. So, uh, right, the next step is for me to figure out how much uh, yeah. All right. So I guess it's kind of halfway. I guess it's really pretty much exactly halfway. Is it? Or do I want to make it? No, let's do halfway. All right. So if this is, if this is 3.25, uh, that is 1.625. One point six two five. Great. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I need to do that. Without that. Actually, half the curve. Yeah, there we go. Now, whenever you do this, it's just best to put a little reference mark on your box so you know which side goes where. But there we go. There's the two halves of my box. And I'm just going to clean them up a little bit here. Uh, let's put some hinges on here. And this is going to be using my drill with a thin bit. And I've got some tiny little screws here. Put a couple here. It is always really good to keep on hand. Oh, come on. Are you really, are you really not gonna, do you mean to say you're a bigger one? Huh? Sorry. I'm talking to my tiny wood screws, which seem to be sized for a number two, just to take a look at this. Oh no. You want to take a look at it here. The, these tiny little wood screws are nonetheless sized for a number two standard uh, Phillips bit. I'm not used to that. All right, so get this here. Okay. Uh, that is not perfectly beautiful, but I don't, I'm not, I'm cool with that. Yeah. Making this with the, ah, uh, there we go. <laughs> this is really kind of ugly, but that's great. It's just protection, that's all. Okay, and then second hinge. 
This is like every minute that the that the gauge sits without some kind of protection is like another opportunity for it to fall. One thing I'm being lazy about is if you're gonna drive some tiny little wood screws, it's good to use an awl to pre-mark them and give yourself a starting hole. It's like a center, center punch to a certain extent. Um, it's good practice. Again, I get lazy and I elide things like that. And well, I pay for that. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get uh, this going here. Ooh. Lots of, uh, you know what I just bought that hasn't arrived yet? I bought a demagnetizer because I realized I have this issue with mag. It's, uh, I need to be able to attune the magnetism of some of the tools that I use because I end up with like these powerful magnetic bits that want to attract the things that I'm screwing into. And then I'm off to the races. Oh, there. Come on. Come on. Said. I think I'm going to use one closure for this, not two, because I don't need two closures for it. All right, let me get this last screw in. Sometimes difficult to finesse with the correct amount of force. Okay, now let's get this closure on here. I'm going to close it. That's how we'll, oh, no, it goes that way. Great. Well, let's, uh, oh, you know what? Let's close that. Great. And we'll bring that up to there. Oh, are these too small? Is that the case? Will they actually? No, that should actually work. That should actually work. Um... Oh, come on. Yeah, I know, I know. I know I should be using the all. I get it, I get it. Now I'm feeling the pressure to like wrap this up and start to answer your questions, but it's a false pressure. It doesn't actually exist. I can just keep on going. I don't have to buy into my schedule pressure. And yet, come on. That's it, there you go. Great, I'll do this top piece. And mark it, and mark it. I've just, I've realized over the years that I really do like a, a pressure of a deadline. Like I really appreciate it, but it becomes a, um, it can become toxic. If I give myself too ridiculous of an arbitrary deadline and then I get stressed out about not meeting that arbitrary deadline, who really cares? Why am I getting so bent out of shape about it? Okay, there we go. We're almost there. So now we've got our little box and we can put these guys in there and this guy over here and we can, yep, okay, let's put that there. Oh, I think these should be reversed. Yeah, yeah, because, great. And I'm very pleased with that. That's really nice. Um, I think the one thing that I want to do is that. Let's put that there, and then this thing can't. Yeah, okay, great. So let's, let's do that. Um,
Come on. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a safe space for my hammer gauge. There she blows. Now she can, oh, yep, yeah, so it tips over that way. Yes, now it can live on my shelf of machine tools safely and without improper, uh, without getting beaten up, un uh, unduly beaten up. There we go.